Students at Dartmouth College in the United States in the late 1980s were being asked to buy computers, and these are humanities students, being asked to spend $1,500 to $2,400 each in the 1980s to buy computers um, to support their studies. And, and I think we can probably be fairly safe in our assumption that uh, the historians amongst them were using that to do the types of statistical analyses that I've just described. So the calculator sense of computing as opposed to other approaches. Um, you're not going to probably be able to see this from the back, but um, I think the same is true here in the UK. And this is an example I got from one of my colleagues named John Stiles of a course that he was planning in 1987 at the University of Bristol. Um, and it was a computing for historians course. And in the outline, they decided they were going to split it into three key themes. Uh, the first was economic theory. The second was economic and social statistical analysis. And the third was economic and social data analysis. So that was a computing course that was designed here in the UK. Um, very clear sense that this is to help students use computers as a tool to do analyses about the past. Uh, 1980s, early 90s, we got a bit of a shift in teaching focus. And I think partly this is down to the rise of what we would call off-the-shelf software, which becomes more prevalent. Um, you can readily buy statistical packages, so SPSS, some of you might be familiar with that. It's, it's, it's still used today in an updated form. We also get a number of database packages. Um, and companies even begin to start advertising directly to historians when it comes to um, database programs. So I, I brought this book along because I was, I was quite surprised to discover this. It's a book called History and Computing. Um, edited by Peter Denley and Dean Hopkins, and it's from, I believe, 1987. And uh, in the back of the book is, is the ad that you see on the screen here. Um, it's, it's, they're trying to sell you a piece of software called Superfile um, for all your database needs, which uh, I thought was quite an interesting uh, new market that the computing world is seeing in, in historians. Um, get out there and buy our products. And I think this is a bit of a change in terms of what people think they need to do with, with computers. And um, in 2001, the quote on the screen there, Nancy Ide suggesting that we don't really need programming skills anymore because we've got this software that's come off the shelf. You can just start using it. So there's a shift in the skill set that's required for um, potential students. Now, that becomes a controversial statement because, as you'll see shortly, we're still teaching people to program in these classes, or at least some people are. Um, so not everybody's accepted that notion that we don't need to do it anymore. But I think actually one of the more interesting things that we're seeing here is that the change in what's being taught is not being driven by historians. It's being driven by Silicon Valley. Um, so this is a change in what the computer can do, and historians are reacting in what they're offering the students. Uh, we are not setting a curriculum ourselves. And I wonder if that's changed today, and we can maybe discuss that a little bit later. I think the new millennium, when we, when we push forward again, we start to get something even more complicated, um, in part because computers, I think, are getting more complex in what they can offer us, uh, and people start using them in diverse ways. And um, I think this is also the time when we first start talking about digital history as opposed to older variations on that theme. And there's a few things that come along that particularly affect the digital history teaching again. Um, and this is the first of those is the internet. And you're going to tell me, well, that's not a new millennium thing. And you're right. But I think it starts to really affect what's being taught at this time. Uh, the second key thing that's going on is mass digitization of historical sources. So we're changing what's available to come into the classroom. Um, and they. As I said, they're not new concepts, but they're, they're really starting to kind of hit their stride in the late 90s and the early new millennium. Uh, and it, it kind of sounds silly to think about it today, but there were a number of people who we might think of as pioneers writing in this early decade um, of the 21st century on things that we would now, I think, take for granted. So the famous book by Dan Cohen and Roy Rosenzweig, which is on the screen here, Digital History, a Guide to Gathering, Preserving, and Presenting the Past on the Web, published in 2005, um, is really obvious today. I mean, it's basically about putting stuff online. We should put history online. And 
I don't think there are too many people um, who would disagree with that. But at the time, it was something that had to be, people had to be convinced of that. And that, that was what was um, one of the key conversations happening uh, at this time. But it's a complete change from John Stiles' class at Bristol, where they're focused on economic theory and on doing historical research. Because this doesn't have anything to do with research, what, what Coleman and Rosenzweig are suggesting. Um, they're suggesting we share history, so they're talking about public history. And that's, that's quite a difference, I think, um, between those, those earlier approaches. Um, same with the digitization of, of these historical resources. I don't think that's really a historical research skill that we're talking about. And a lot of that work was done in the glam industry. So galleries, libraries, archives, museums. These aren't historians that are necessarily driving it. That's not to say that there aren't historians that are actively involved in it. But it's something that requires the collection management skills of a different set of professionals than um, than what historians are doing. But it's still being branded as a digital history activity, and I think that starts to complicate the narrative of what digital history is, and therefore, if you're learning about it, what do you need to know? Um, it gets more complicated a few years later because we start to see people noticing that these digitized resources have provided new research potential. We've got all this stuff, what can we do with it? Uh, we start seeing people talking about big data and about data analysis as well. So we've got lots of things that start happening within basically a 10 year period which start multiplying what constitutes digital history um, and complicating that pedagogical space as well. So rise of the internet, rise of web 2.0, uh, mass digitization, and then early notions of, hey, can we do some data analysis that we couldn't do before? So quite a distinct shift from the statistics focus of, of earlier um, cohorts. And I think that's one of the reasons why I suggest that there is no digital history curriculum. Um, because instead what we get is kind of a mishmash of what people, individuals, were interested in, what they thought the digital skills were. And I think probably that often comes down to whatever they were doing. Um, and, and generally speaking, you would only kind of be good at one, maybe two of these things, rather than being good at all of them. Uh, and that, again, kind of makes us think, well, what is it that we need to teach our students? And maybe what we need to do is we need to remember some of the things that were being talked in the, about in the earlier decades. So I've got a quote here from 1988. Uh, from a conference on digital pedagogy, which was held in Southampton. And it's about the idea that um, people are actually coming to study history when they're doing a history degree, and maybe we should remember that. So um, this is from Lou Bernard and Judith Proud. And what they say is, whilst new technology has a lot to offer the humanities, particularly teaching in the humanities, a great deal of caution and selection should be exercised in the manner and degree to which it is applied. So there's that kind of a warning there, like let's not throw out the baby with the bathwater when we're, when we're thinking about how we might change teaching. And we've had a lot of people that have kind of thought about some of these issues and what should we not be doing. Um, and we see a lot of this in blog posts, in recent blog posts uh, as well. So Mark Perry, um, for example, noted that students yawn at the field's arcane issues, like how to evaluate digital work in tenure decisions. So don't teach your undergraduate history students about your challenges getting tenure because you're a digital historian. Pretty obvious stuff, obviously. Um, Ryan Cordell did a great talk, um, keynote talk in 2015 called How Not to Teach Digital Humanities. And it's about humanities. It was done in the literature department, but it was still, I thought, really cool because he managed to convince librarians that he could take live candles into the library <laughs> um, so that his students could transcribe books as if they were in an old monastic, uh, um, what are they called, um, scriptorium. So they, they could appreciate the process of creating knowledge and transforming knowledge and, and understand that progression from the medieval monks right up to the, to the modern day. And, and ask what it is to study culture. So I thought that was a really interesting idea here. And it's also a reminder that we need to think about student engagement and student experience in the classroom as well. It's not just about getting stuff in their head. It's about um, thinking about the ways that they learn. 
Andrew Goldstone as well, this was just in January of this year, um, had a great blog post on, on how fast we should be doing digital skills teaching and, and this notion that you can't just cram it all in one class. This is something that has to percolate over a number of years and a number of courses and have it be across the curriculum. So there's lots of good stuff in that gray literature there about what we shouldn't be doing and, and we should take heed of that when we, when we see it and maybe share more often. Now, I'd like to switch focus a little bit because I want to I want to spend the rest of my time with you today talking about digital history syllabi um, and 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 what was actually happening in the classroom. Um, syllabi are not the classroom, obviously, but I think they're about as close as we can get in terms of a written historical record of what was going on. So in order to build some understanding, I went and did a bit of digging, and I managed to put together a corpus of 126 digital history syllabi. Um, these are only from Canada, the United States, and England, and they cover the period 2003 right up until this year, 2017. And what we've got is 83 unique courses and 43 that have been revised. Uh, usually when they're revised, it's by the same instructor, but that's not necessarily always the case. Sometimes a few years down the line, somebody else takes it over. Uh, and I've, I've done my best to kind of limit this to history departments, although sometimes it's difficult to tell. Now, these are all of the, the syllabi that I was able to find. Uh, they're not everything that ever existed because I had to be able to find it in order for me to include it. But I think this is a pretty good coverage of what was available. Um, at least in the sense that I imagine I've got a good chunk of all universities who ever offered a digital history course, even if I don't have every instance of what they offered every year. Uh, obviously, I don't have everything. Uh, survivability really depended on whether or not an individual instructor decided to archive, self-archive the material because universities generally don't want old syllabi online. It's confusing to students because they do the wrong readings or they get confused. It also makes it look um, dated over time. So it really depends who is putting stuff up. And as it happens, William J. Turkell or Bill Turkell um, at Western University in Canada uh, was by far the best at doing this. He self-archived every instance of every course that he ever taught on his research website. Um, and actually, it was his class that I first took in digital history back in 2008, so that's where I kind of got into this as well. But he's unusual. Um, as you can see here, nobody else comes close to this. The next closest we've got is Lincoln Mullen with nine, and in, in he's in the United States. And um, in England, I had a hell of a time actually funding syllabi. I had to ask people because uh, course management systems here are virtually all closed behind password protected walls. So I couldn't get anybody's other than my own, other than people that I individually knew were teaching and sent emails to to get information on. So thank you to those of you who, who shared that. But it has left me with a bit of a gap in terms of what I know about English teaching. Uh, which is unfortunate, and that's, I think, increasingly going to be a problem for studies like this. So the first thing I want to share, you can almost read that, USA, Canada, England. Uh, first thing I wanted to say, this is a male-dominated space, at least in terms of the people who were sharing their syllabi online. I didn't find any Canadian women who were doing so, so if you are a Canadian woman and you have them, let me know. Uh, but men outnumber women 49 to 15 in this space. Uh, we can talk about why or what that might mean in our discussion if you'd like, but I, um, I don't want to dwell on that too much uh, at this stage. Secondly, um, in terms of geographical distribution, I was surprised by the relatively low number of institutions who were involved in this at all. Um, if we include digital humanities courses, that looks a lot healthier, um, but a lot of that is literature stuff, so I've, I've been selective here. And I think the, the, the literature teaching makes it look like we've got a lot more digital teaching than from a historian's perspective than we actually do. And this is surprising to me because despite the fact that I was able to find more than a thousand places where you could study history degrees in these three countries, um, only a few handfuls have ever taught a digital history course 
that, um, that I was able to find. So that means that the vast majority of historians do not have formal training access to this material. And even within these three countries, I've got a bit of a heat map, which admittedly is kind of small, but you can download the slides later. Um, the connection to the state of Virginia is absolutely overwhelming, uh, particularly in the early years. So if we leave aside Vilter Kell's stuff that he was doing at Western University in Canada, um, the early adopters are almost all connected to Virginia in some way. So 2004, we've got University of Virginia. Um, the same year, we've got um, Josh Greenberg is teaching at Cornell University, which is in New York. But he leaves immediately after that and goes and joins an institution in Virginia. Um, the following year, George Mason University in Virginia starts teaching. Um, University of Lincoln, Nebraska starts teaching. That's obviously not in Virginia, but it's taught by someone who had just arrived from Virginia. So um, Mary Washington University in Virginia. So it, until 2011, I actually don't have any syllabi um, from a place that wasn't connected to Virginia in some way, other than Bill Trickell's stuff in Canada. Um, and that, that wasn't until Kathy Moran uh, at NYU and then Tim Hitchcock at Hertfordshire uh, finally started something different. And I may have missed things, but I just that connection to Virginia is just really strong and quite striking because it suggests a very small core of people who probably knew each other personally are having a huge influence on what we're doing. Uh, the biggest group in terms of one institution, uh, the largest number of syllabi was George Mason University in Virginia, and they had 28. And this is the home of the Roy Rosenzweig Center for History and New Media, so perhaps that's not surprising. Um, Bill Turkel uh, at Western University. Western University had 26, 24 of those were Bill Turkel's. Um, so it's pretty much a one-man show uh, in that case. And in England, we max out at about three, so uh, a lot lower. I think a lot of that comes down to the fact that it's, it's happening a bit later, or it seems to be happening a bit later. So um, again, that's something that we might want to talk about. Can we read these almost? I can, can you read those? <coughs> yeah. Um, I also want to talk about who's not teaching it. And, one of the striking things is that the research intensive universities seem not to be teaching this stuff. Um, the Ivy League in the United States, which is supposedly the cream of the crop, four of them are on there, which is pretty good. I think um, Harvard, Cornell, Columbia, Pennsylvania all have at least one class. Um, the other four did not. So Princeton, Dartmouth, Brown, and Yale, or at least I didn't find them. Doesn't mean they never had one, but I didn't find them. That doesn't mean they're not doing any digital work, because I'm sure some of you know the Women's Writers Project, for example, had been running at Brown for, for many years. But that's not something that was, um, I, I believe that was a literature initiative, and therefore I don't think it was something that was um, directly engaging necessarily with the historian. So maybe that's why they didn't have a course on it. Um, Canada is not doing nearly as well as the Americans in terms of the elite universities. So Western University is the only one it shows up there. Um, the classification there is called the medical doctoral universities. So these are the ones that um, tend to do the majority of PhD training. And then in England, we have not a single Russell Group um, institution who uh, is offering one of these courses, at least again, as I said, as I was able to find. I think that's a problem for a couple of reasons, because I think generally these so-called top schools disproportionately feed people into the future professoriate, so we've got potential sustainability problems. This stuff isn't going to filter in unless it starts being taught um, where people are going to become university lecturers. Uh, I think it also suggests that the vast majority of universities still don't see digital history as something that's central enough to what they do to bother to put this onto the curriculum. And again, I think that has implications for future growth for the field. So I suppose there's one of our problems that we can think about is that this stuff is still not being widely taught. Let's think about content as well. So what's being taught? Um, is it changing over time? So in order to answer some of those questions, I've done some classification. And I did a close reading of all of the syllabi that was in this um, collection here. And I classified them into three different types of categories. So the first one is the balance between history and digital. So is this a history course? Is it a digital course? Is it somewhere in the middle? 
And I'll go through each of these in turn. Um, the other one, the second one, is the type of digital history that we're trying to teach. I've gone through a bit of an overview of that in my, in my whirlwind tour, but I'll go into more depth in just a minute. And then the third one is just some specific looks. So things that I was seeing a lot, and then so I went back over and, and tried to determine how often is this stuff actually popping up. So just to give you an example of that, we see a lot of blogging. So how prevalent was blogging amongst these uh, modules. So I'll start with the degree of historical emphasis here, the balance between history and digital teaching. Um, and this one, I was quite surprised by this actually because there is shockingly little history being taught in digital history classes, at least over the entire period. So I've gone through each of the unique courses on offer here and classifying the extent to which history is, is the core focus of what's going on here as opposed to digital. Um, and in order to be classified as, as having a high category, so the, this green circle here, a high historical emphasis, um, I decided that a course had to make digital secondary to um, the history. So um, this had to be something that would look very much at home in a history department, that if you were kind of looking at it, you could reasonably say this is a history course. <coughs> And um, only 11 out of those 83 unique courses uh, could pass muster as, as a history class. Uh, and the first one that I was able to find was by Cameron Blevins at Stanford University in 2012, uh, where he taught a class on the history of the American West. And what he did was he used a series of digital approaches, almost like case studies, to explore that topic through digital um, approaches and help the students understand the history of the American West. So the goal is very much about understanding history, the way that we tend to teach historical topics more broadly. But he's, he's drawing on those um, things such as mapping, um, textual analysis, network analysis, and, and thinking about power and space. Uh, in his description, he notes, and I'll just quote him here, by pairing traditional forms of historical analysis with cutting edge technological tools, the class will explore how competing visions of the West played out in the mental maps of 19th century Westerners and non-Westerners. So it's a history class, but it's a history class that uses the digital elements to, to teach the students in a new way. This is a fairly new approach. 2012 is the first one. Um, it's, it's also the one that has proved to be most popular in England from what I've been able to discern. And in fact, most of the English syllabi that were taught this year seem to take this approach. Well, Bob Nicholson is one of our colleagues up at Edge Hill University. He teaches what he calls um, traditional modules on the history of crime and journalism. But he does it in a computer lab and um, digital skills are kind of incorporated in what he does, but the focus is still on that historical theme. Uh, one of Justin's colleagues, Lisa Smith, also a historian, she's Canadian by, um, by right and by, by birth, <laughs> uh, but she's, she's teaching here in the UK and she's got a class called the Digital Recipes Project. And again, it's, 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 it's focusing on the history as opposed to necessarily the digital, but it's definitely embedded in what she's doing. And it's interesting because this recent development of History First really kind of goes back to what was going on in the 1980s when historians were using it to do history, to do research in a way that um, has, wasn't necessarily the focus um, in the middle period, as, as I'll, I'll discuss. And I w was kind of reflecting on, well, why is this happening in England? Why is this the focus in England? And I, I suspect it might be down to some of the pressures that English scholars face with regards to publishing and things like REF, where um, people in North America will tell me there's tons of pressure to publish. But I think my impression as a North American is it seems to be more constant here. You spend your entire career under pressure to keep publishing, whereas um, I've, I've seen many, many profiles of North American scholars who've got their tenure and kind of decided to stop publishing for a decade. So, I wonder if that continued emphasis on research in the English system has um, translated into uh, the classroom as well. And I think also my impression coming here, having done my undergraduate in Canada, um, my sense is that 
the undergraduate students in history degrees here are taught almost like researchers in training in a way that they're not in North America. Uh, in North America, a history degree, I think, is more likely to be seen as a, a way of instilling good citizenship and, and empathy and um, living and creating an understanding society. So there's a different view about what the purpose of a history degree is. But I thought it was interesting to point out that this seems to be a fairly English phenomenon, particularly because here we are in England. Uh, in terms of the moderate category, the red one um, next to it here, uh, these are courses that have some kind of a historical theme, but um, more of a digital emphasis. So it's, it's swinging slightly more to the digital side of things. And this becomes more, much more common about 2012. Uh, it's also much more likely to be an American approach. This is, this is much, much, much more common in, in, in American classrooms. And what I found really interesting about this is that these themed classes overwhelmingly were adopting local history topics. And it was more likely to be a local history than something of interest to the instructor. So they're not even using their own research interest. It's like, let's do the local history of this area and, and, and put the material online. So I've got a few examples of this. Um, Leslie Madison Brooks, 2014. She's at Boise State University. And the students had to create a local history of what she calls the Central Rim neighborhood. And this is the neighborhood where the university happens to be. So they're, they're creating an exhibit that tells some of the, the local history. And we see this time and again. Um, Adina Langer, Atlanta Beltline at Georgia State University. So the Beltline being the ring road around Atlanta. So the students are focusing very much on that local history of where they decided to go to school. Um, and, and there's a great example as well, Fred Gibbs, who was one of my um, former colleagues on the program and historian, he moved to the University of Me New Mexico in, um, I think, 2013, and when he put on his digital history course, decided to do that local history thing in his adopted um, city of Albuquerque. So it's not, it had nothing to do with his research interests at all, but it was, let's find something that we can all connect to. Uh, even more local than that, I found three examples of American uh, universities where they were challenged to research their own university. So we're not even leaving campus. It's let's, <laughs> let's research us. And um, one of them in particular, Ann Mitchell Wisnant in 2014, had the students um, dig into the, the white male personas who all the buildings had been named after. So let's understand all these old dead white guys who we've named all the buildings. So that, that really kind of interesting local focus of American uh, digital history. I only found one class that had historiography in the reading list, but no theme. So they're using historiography, but, but no obvious theme to tie it all together. I call that a low emphasis. And I think the most striking thing for me is that 40, 40 out of 83, nearly half of these, nothing obviously historical in them whatsoever. And this is despite the fact that these are targeted at historians. So there's a really interesting thing going on there because what we're getting is a message that digital historians don't teach history. Um, and we might want to ask ourselves if that's a good thing or not. The second set, um, classification is looking at what type of teaching are we looking at here? And this is um, what form of digital history are we interested in? And it's possible at this stage for you to have more than one. So these don't equal up to 83 like the previous one. So you can have you can have your tone and a couple of things here. Uh, if we look at this kind of chronologically between um, categories that became popular over time, I'll start with the quantitative side of things. Uh, Cleometrics and quantitative research methods. So this is very much the statistical stuff that we were talking about from the 80s and the 90s and even earlier than that. And uh, emphatically, this is not being taught in digital history courses. Uh, and in fact, I only found rudimentary statistics in three out of 83 courses. Two of those were offered by conveners of this seminar. <laughs> uh, and they're not even central to what's going on. I mean, they're almost throwaways in the fact that they're there. So James Baker here. University of Sussex includes Pat Hudson's history by numbers on his reading list. Uh, that, that, uh, as far as I'm aware, that's, that's the extent of how far he's gone into it. You can correct me later if, if we're wrong. 
Uh, but that's one of the success stories of, of engaging with quantitative history. Uh, Melody Beals, who I believe is listening to us from California, she's also one of our conveners. Um, she had a session in which she taught students how to use a, how to create a column graph using data that she provided them in Microsoft Excel, and then they can do some fairly basic um, visualization and understanding uh, fairly simple numbers, I think. And then the third case is Thomas Friedman uh, included, and that was an American example, including a week on what he called quantitative analysis. So that was probably the most substantial um, case that I came across. So this is a dramatic rejection of this quantitative analysis of these earlier historians. So there's a clear line being drawn here saying, that's not what we do, that's not who we are. Uh, we can talk about why that is, perhaps, in the discussion. I think if I was going to be provocative, I would suggest it's because most of us don't know statistics well enough to actually teach it. The second category here, um, by far the biggest, the red one here, public history or digital public history. 53 out of 83, so a majority of these are um, digital public history. This is overwhelmingly the way that Canadian and American scholars are teaching digital history courses. And by digital public history, I mean an emphasis not on doing history, but on using the web to engage with audiences and presenting it um, to people who might be interested in historical content. So this is about building web archives, about building exhibits. And this is so common in North America, particularly until about 2014, that if somebody told you they were teaching a digital history course, you can almost assume that that's what they were doing at that time in, in North America. Um, not as common in England, although I'll admit I did do that when I first started teaching digital history, perhaps because of my North American background. Um, and again, I, I wonder if that's again because of the pressures of the ref and the way that English historians see themselves as principally as researchers and students are, are researchers in training. Um, and the people that do the public history work maybe aren't the same ones that are working within the history departments and therefore that's not trickling into the system in the same way. I don't know, that's just speculation. Um, despite the fact that everybody seems to be doing digital public history, at least in North America, they're not all doing it the same way. So there is quite a lot of variation within individual modules. Um, some of them focus very much on web design, so how do you do a, an effective website, particularly if we think 10, 15 years ago it was more difficult to do web design and you had to know a lot more than you have to know today. Uh, but then on the other hand, we've got Bill Trickell had a, had a class that he ran a number of times called interactive exhibit building, uh, which is again public history, but it was focused on, it was part of a public history MA, and it was focused on teaching the students to build interactive museum displays. So um, using physical computing devices, teaching them how to program these things that would do stuff. Uh, and this stuff could be beeping or moving or a light turning on or just something to go beyond that, that notion of a museum text panel that is completely uninteractive. So still public history focused, but very different than the web design skills that you could get in other courses. Uh, the third category here in the, the middle, the yellow one, 24, uh, this is building tools. Um, this is a category where I've included two different things here. So um, both programming, so learning to program so you can build a tool, uh, build some software of your own and courses that talk about programming in a way that suggests maybe you might want to do this. So this is about the process of creating a digital tool that will do stuff to stuff and give you a result. Um, on the fourth category here, the, the blue one, data analysis. Data analysis is more about using someone else's tool. So there's a difference there between um, are you going to build it or are you going to use it? And there's, there's implications there about what type of a digital historian I think you are. More common to see the data analysis than the programming. Um, and I think maybe we can suggest that that's because it's easier to get students to use other people's tools than it is to teach them enough programming to, to create something viable and useful within the amount of time that you get for a course. But the fact that 24 out of 84, so about a quarter of these courses, are teaching or talking about programming, um, suggests that Nancy Ide's claim from 2001 that we don't need it anymore has been rejected by uh, a significant number of these educators. 
The tool using, one of the things I would just, just to pick up on what I said earlier, one of the things I would say is perhaps problematic in this is that they tend to be quantitatively based, but we're not teaching the quantitative skills to interpret these responsibly because only James has any, any quantitative or, or Melody has any quantitative skills on their courses. So we're teaching people to use tools without teaching them how to interpret the results. And I've, I've used this example before in this seminar, but uh, Rebecca Kozner has been writing about what she calls trusting others to do the maths. And this is, of course, used pejoratively towards digital humanities scholars as, as just assuming that the mathematics are all right and that I, I don't need to know that stuff. And I think that's quite alarming, actually, um, when we see the extent to which some of this stuff is being taught. Um, digital tools actually become the mainstay by 2013, so they're really starting to replace those public history courses that I described a minute ago. So we've got shifts happening here. So we start in the 80s, we've got the numbers, um, we end up with a large emphasis on public history, and we've got a shift then coming into these digital tools. So there's a change happening over time. Uh, the final category, the purple category here, uh, 41, so about half of them. I call this a wide survey approach or, or a shotgun approach to teaching um, digital history. And I think this is a good natured attempt to do everything in one class or one course. So you might teach HTML one week and then the next week you come back and do sent sentiment analysis and then um, principles of design. Um, so it's, it's a little bit from kind of everywhere and there's not necessarily coherence to tie it all together. I think that's raising some problems for students in terms of what is it that I'm, what are we learning here? What, what are the actual learning objectives? And we might think of it as, an, as I said, a good natured attempt of a colleague to try to put in all the skills that they think the students need, but they're not getting from everyone else in the department um, and do it all in one go. And, and we might want to reflect on how effective that is. Uh, there was a really interesting example from one of my colleagues, Ian Milligan. Uh, and he had a class in 2014 in which he allowed students to choose quite broadly on their final project. So they had a choice between a historical website, public history, a textual analysis, so a data analysis, or creating a tool in Python. So basically, um, any of these categories, whatever one you are interested in, you can do um, your final project on. And this pluralist approach becomes really quite common in the last few four years or so. Um, and I think that's partly because those of us who are coming into this teaching look around and see all these different types of teaching and think maybe we've got to do it all. Um, but it's something that by 2017, just last year, seems to have been rejected quite heavily. And we've had this move back towards these, these history first courses. And I, I wonder if that's because students weren't taking them or because uh, they just lacked coherence, or people realized it didn't work, whatever it was. But for a few years there, there was this just peppering students with everything that they might need to know. Um, and I think maybe thankfully that's starting to fade away. Specific content, um, just a few things that were popping up lots and I thought would be worth kind of digging into a little bit more. Uh, the, the public history courses were particularly characteristic of project-based teaching and assessment. So uh, this is the most uniting thing in a digital history course, is the fact that you are probably not expected to write an essay, you are going to do a project. And um, what that project is varies rather widely. Some of them are solo initiatives, and that I think mirrors very well on what historians tend to do in class, go off to the library and work on your own. But there's also quite a lot of um, group work as well. And there were some interesting initiatives, even quite early, on helping students to pick up those group work skills. So uh, back in 2008, Jack McClurkin in the United States came up with an idea of, of a collaborator's contract. So this was getting the students together to talk about their, their working styles and their expectations for each other and how they were going to solve problems uh, if conflicts arose. And that's not something you're typically going to find in a history curriculum, I don't think. But it's incredibly valuable when we're talking about um, some of the digital projects and the collaborative working that, that people do here. So I thought that was an interesting example. Uh, blogging is also very common. Blogging is, we've got 44 blogging examples, so about half of them are doing that. Um, the first example that I was able to find was Josh Greenberg in um, in 2004 at Cornell, 
Uh, he then went to George Mason University the following year and took the practice with him and it started to spread from there because everybody at George Mason started blogging in about 2005 and it just started appearing and percolating around, um, around these courses. And I'm not entirely sure that people knew why they were putting it on the courses. Um, at least I'm not convinced that they knew because virtually nobody says why they're doing it. Uh, it's just one of those things that, well, I blog, so naturally, as a digital historian, if you want to be a digital historian, you need to blog too. Um, and there was one exception to that that I was able to find, and that was Bill Turkel, who credits a book from 1983 called The Reflective Practitioner by Donald Schoen. Um, and it's this notion of we get better by reflecting on how things went. And I think actually that's what we're asking people to do when we're asking them to write blogs, but instead of calling it reflective practice, it was called blogging. And I wonder if that's maybe why it didn't percolate outside of digital history and into the history classes. So if we had sold it in a different way and actually ironically reflected on why we were asking students to be reflective, uh, it may have gone beyond digital history. Of course, that's, um, that's kind of falling away now. People aren't blogging as much on these courses. I think a lot of digital historians as well aren't blogging as much. Uh, but that doesn't mean that it wasn't doing some interesting things for a while. Um, so Sean Graham, who's based in, at Carleton in, in uh, Canada, decided to use it as a way to create uh, a learning community for the students. So he set aside 20% of their grades for for com communicating on each other's blogs and helping each other to work through their ideas. And I thought that was kind of an innovative idea. And it's something that we can do through message boards and forums and discussion groups in other ways. But it was, it was that notion of, of having the students talk to each other outside of the classroom. Um, there's also been some interesting examples of creating intra-institutional teaching. So there's a couple of historians um, in Texas, uh, Andrew Torget and Caleb McDaniel, they were at two different Texas universities, and they decided to teach their courses on the same theme at the same time and have the students act almost as pen pals to one another. Uh, so they're working on the history of slavery, and um, as the students were working on their projects, they were sharing them in progress with the other group and breaking down those traditional barriers between institutions. Uh, and I know Lisa Smith at Essex is doing that as well. She's been working with people at Pennsylvania, so that's actually going internationally, um, and it's something I think would be cool if we see more of. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if it's digital, but it seems to have been something that um, has at least been tested out by digital people. Um, also common, the, the yellow circle here is 31 out of 83. Dan Cohen and Roy Rosenzweig's Digital History, the book, is um, on a lot of syllabi, and this is despite the fact that I think it's now quite questionably useful, um, particularly if you're not teaching that digital public history um, style, because it's really just about how to put stuff online. And we've all got machines in our pocket that can do that now. So do we still need this on the, on the reading list? I'm not convinced. I imagine Dan would probably admit as well that maybe we don't. Um, but it interestingly doesn't fall off. It, it tends to stay on. Once it's on, it stays there, um, which, is, which is interesting. Um, and then the last category there is just historiography, and historiography would be the mainstay of the history course generally, but only a quarter of these courses had any historiography on them, which again is, is this notion that um, digital historians don't talk to historians, which potentially is a problematic message to be sending to the students. And we're the only ones in the, in the history department who are talking to historians in a traditional way, and instead of these historiographical journal articles and books. Instead, what we see is uh, blog posts and technical um, readings and generally free stuff that's available online. Free seems to be quite a common um, theme. So, so just to kind of tie this up and bring it back together into a bit of a trajectory, because I told you I was going to tell you a history, and history needs to have not a, a narrative arc to it. So. Um, We tend to see waves happening here, um, starting with the statistical computing of the early era, uh, moving into digital public history, and then once we get to the present, we start to get the waves get shorter, or at least I've got better at noticing them. So there's shorter waves of, of people trying out different things. 
I don't get a great sense that there's a lot of engagement backwards with the previous groups. It's almost like every group comes and says, you know, we just discovered this great new thing called a computer, and we're going to be the first historians to use this, and everybody look at what we've done. Um, and this, I think that's a problem. I mean, I call this the eternal present problem, is everybody thinks that they're coming to this new. Um, and that cuts short the long conversations that our colleagues are having in the rest of the historical profession that, that go back decades, and, and we just don't have that tradition, which um, might be problematic. I think um, one of the things that I found quite concerning was um, the lack of quantitative skills that are being taught. And I think that's something that we might need to figure out how to address as a community, particularly if we're going to continue teaching these tools. Um, but I think one of the things I was quite excited to see was my colleagues, some of whom are in this room, going back to the history first approach of teaching and making it about what the students actually came to and trying to appeal to their their interest in history as a way into this stuff. And I'm, I'm personally hoping to see more of that as we move forward. I think that ties in with the, the, the philosophy of this seminar where we've always tried to get people to, to tell us how your history, uh, how your research changes history rather than telling us how you made your database. Um, so I think there's a lot of potential, there's a lot of problems. Hopefully I've, I've thrown up some things that we can um, maybe talk about here. Um, but what I wanted to leave you with is just a selection here of syllabi that I said that are worth reading. I put myself on there, not because I think it's the best example, but because it's the only English one that's available openly on the web. And I thought we need to have at least one. Um, but I think if you went through these, you'd have a pretty good sense of um, how digital history teaching has changed, the, the multiplicity of types of digital history teaching that have been going on, and also some of the really cool examples of people doing some innovative things. And I wouldn't have put my own on there if, if everybody else had put theirs up on the internet. So I'll leave it at that, but thank you for your um, attention. And I'd love to hear um, some of your thoughts and some of, the, some of the things I'm totally wrong about. Because I'm sure there are some. <laughs>